on behalf of Campbell & Company, I'd like to welcome you to One Size Does Not Fit All, Keys to Successful Fundraising for Federated Organizations. Before we get started, I would like to review some technical recommendations with you to ensure you have the best experience possible. First, close any programs, other than GoToWebinars, of course, that are running on your computer. Call in using a telephone instead of using your computer speakers. Move your cell phone away from your computer. And finally, if you experienced any visual issues, you can send a chat to Campbell & Company or contact GoTo at 1-800-263-6317. Finally, today's webinar will last 60 minutes and you will earn one continuing education credit for your participation. And that is good for certification with CFRE International. About an hour after the webinar, you will receive an email that includes a web address to download your certificate the PDF of the presentation, as well as information on how to register for our next webinar. We do welcome questions during the webinar, so if you have any, please send a chat to Campbell and & Company, and Edith will ask them throughout. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Edith Falk. Edith? Sarah, thank you, uh, and welcome to all of you who are participating in today's webinar. Uh, we're going to use a panel format, so there will be a lot of give and take throughout our discussion today. And we have two extraordinary panelists joining us uh, on our session uh, today. Our first panelist is, there you go, Barbara Bushnell. Barbara is the Vice President of Development at Planned Parenthood Los Angeles. Barbara has more than 19 years as a professional in the nonprofit sector. And in addition to her work in arts, education, literacy programs, and other programs addressing the needs of underserved populations, Barbara also has experience with two other organizations that are local chapters of national organizations. One was the when she was development director for the Pacific Southwest region of the Anti-Defamation League. And the other was when she was chief development officer for the San Gabriel Valley chapter of the American Red Cross. So Barbara brings to us a lot of experience in working at the chapter level as part of a larger national organization. Our uh, second panelist is Jethro Miller, who represents the perspective from the national organization. Uh, Jethro is the Vice President of Principal and Major Gifts at the American Red Cross, uh, where he oversees the organization's nationwide strategies for individual giving and the engagement of the organization's national and chapter boards. But prior to joining the Red Cross, uh, Jethro was a consultant with CCS Fundraising, and in that role directed capital campaigns for a number of organizations, including a number of national organizations that have chapters around the country, such as the U.S. Fund for UNICEF, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the Rotary Foundation, as well as a number of other uh, organizations. So. Um, both of our panelists will bring both that national experience and that chapter experience to bear in our discussion today. But the other piece I want to share with you about Jethro is that uh, in uh, before the end of the month, actually next week, uh, Jethro will be transitioning to a new role, uh, and he will, uh, and that new role is as Chief Development Officer for the Planned Parenthood Federation of America and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund. So. Uh, we didn't know we were going to have two Planned Parenthood uh, representatives when we first put this webinar together, and actually technically uh, Jethro is not quite yet a member of the Planned Parenthood team, but he will be shortly. So uh, this should be a really engaging uh, and uh, uh, exciting discussion. So uh, as Sarah said, we'll be uh, watching for your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll um, try to address those that relate to the content that's on the screen at the time. Uh, but we'll also reserve some time at the end of our session uh, today to answer any questions that come up throughout the course of our webinar. And any, any that we don't answer uh, on the live webinar today, we'll address through email after this session. So let me just um, begin by telling you a little bit about the origin of this uh, conversation today. It's really based on some research with Cam which Campbell & Company conducted in the summer and fall of last year. Uh, as we looked at the uh, role of chapters in the national organization and how they might work together uh, in the fundraising process. And this really came out of work that Campbell and Company had done around the country, working both with, uh, sometimes with local organizations, 
uh, that were part of a larger national organization and sometimes uh, with working with a national organization that had chapters or affiliates across the country. And as we worked with them, we found a number of common themes. We found tensions around a number of areas. Uh, and as we got further into this, we really wanted to understand how to address some of these tensions and what were some of the best practices. One of the questions that came up uh, often is, who owns the donor? Uh, every donor lives somewhere. Uh, and some donors have multiple homes in multiple parts of the country. Some donors give locally. Some donors give nationally. Some donors give to both the national and the local organization. So technically, who owns that donor? And if you will, who has first dibs on that donor? We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The other tension or the other theme that we heard uh, consistently is, what story do we want to tell? And often we found that the role of the national organization uh, is sometimes really quite different from the role of a local or chapter affiliate. For example, often the chapter is responsible for providing direct service in the local geographic area, whereas the national organization is often more responsible for advocacy or education or outreach activities. So how, do we, how does the organization tell a consistent story, and which story is it telling to which donor? Another question that often came up is, how do we allocate gift revenue? If the national organization is handling direct marketing and a donor makes a gift to that program, how much of that gift goes back to the local chapter, if any, and what are the formulas for that? And then the concern that we heard over and over again is, we can't afford to lose this gift. So if the national organization comes in to see one of our prospects, one of our donors, they're going to take that money away from us. Well, that's not the case. And I think really what we're looking at here <clears throat> is how do, how do we, it's really not a them versus us situation, but how do we create strategies? How do we create approaches uh, that really are win-win, win for the local organization as win for the national organization? So as we thought about these tensions, we also saw that there were many opportunities to learn from one another. The national staff had a lot to offer the local staff. The local staff had a lot to offer their colleagues in other parts of the country. And so how, did, how does the organization take advantage of all those resources? We also saw opportunities to engage donors more deeply in the mission, to understand more broadly the work of the organization across the country, even internationally in some cases. And so how do we get that story across to them? We also saw an opportunity to secure increasing support. Oftentimes, a local chapter, uh, for a local chapter, a big gift may be half a million dollars, a million dollars. They may not be able to um, request an, a larger gift from a donor who has significant capacity because they can't put together a story that's large enough in their local affiliate. So, how do we engage that donor who has the ability to make a $5 million or a, or a $10 million gift? Um, so there are opportunities to work together uh, chapter to chapter or chapter to na uh, with national to secure increasing support. And there's also an opportunity to operate more cost effectively, uh, both to leverage your uh, relationships with vendors uh, as well as to possibly reduce the number of mailings just generally to, re to look at receiving a higher return on investment. So we know that in the audience we have people who are representing local affiliates or chapters. We also have representatives from national organizations. And I guess the, the one point I want to make here, and this is the title of this webinar, is that one size does not necessarily fit all. So you're going to hear us re reflect some different perspectives as we continue our dialogue here. Um, and we hope that each of you will be able to take away from this discussion some strategies or some uh, key principles that will be applicable to your organization. It's also a huge topic, and we're only going to be able to scratch the surface of that topic today. So hopefully we'll have other opportunities down the road to engage others of you in conversation. So in summary, as Campbell & Company was doing its research, our objectives were to understand how the structure of the organization affects their ability to work collaboratively in fundraising, uh, to understand the different challenges inherent in federation fundra federated fundraising, and ultimately to identify some best practices and strong examples of successful models. So one of the first uh, 
sort of obvious conclusions we were able to draw here is that federation organiz federated organizations take many forms and structures. And in our two panelists here, we have representatives from two organizations that are structured uh, really quite differently. And you'll hear as we work our way through this webinar today how that affects their ability to collaborate uh, in fundraising and the different strategies and practices they're able to put into place. So and Jethro, I'm going to ask you to say a few words about the structure at the American Red Cross, and then I'm going to ask Barbara to do that uh, for Planned Parenthood at, uh, in just a moment. Great. Well, thank you, Edith, and thank you so much for uh, having me today to participate on the webinar. This is one of the, the issues that uh, I'm most personally intrigued by, um, having had the opportunity to work in a number of different organizations with very different structures that then manifest into uh, very different fundraising programs. Um, and the Red Cross, we are a little different um, than many other federated organizations in that we are one national 501c3 organization. So while we have 500 chapters all across the country, and those chapters roll up into 90 regions and seven divisions, we are one organization. Um, we only have one board uh, that has fiduciary responsibility. Uh, we have 500 chapter boards, uh, but they really are not boards of independent organizations. Um, our fundraising, we have fundraising leadership at the regional level, so at the level of 90. Uh, regions. We have a chief development officer in each of those regions, um, and those chief development officers both jointly report to their local CEOs as well as to division fundraising leaders, leaders who report to our national CDO. So we are more integrated um, than some other organizations. Um, the, our national development team, uh, primarily based at our national headquarters in Washington, plays a, um, a sales support role, a strategy role, a program development role. Um, for the fundraising that for the most part, uh, not solely, but for the most part takes place in those regions um, across the country. Um, so consequently, we have one budget uh, with one revenue and expense um, target nationally and then local pieces um, of that as opposed to separate budgets. So um, that's where we are now. Uh, that's always where we've been legally um, in practice, uh, prior to our current CEO coming on board about six years ago, uh, we were in practice operating as almost independent organizations, even though we were legally one entity. And we've undergone a significant transformation the last few years to, to more closely operate um, as one integrated organization. So that's been an interesting transition over the last few years, Edith. Yes. Jethro, thank you. And I think as we uh, continue to, to uh, dialogue here, we'll learn a little bit more about some of those transitions and how the Red Cross managed those transitions, because I think that's, a, that's an interesting story as well. So Barbara, uh, Planned Parenthood organization is structured really quite differently. Tell us a little bit more about that. OK. Um, and thank you also for including me today. Um, I'm always happy to um, participate in Campbell and Company webinars. I think you do a great service for our um, sector. Um, Planned Parenthood is, um, as, as uh, Jethro will learn shortly, uh, very different in structure from the American Red Cross. Um, but n there's no indication that any one or the other is any different or better or worse. So um, I think it's just a question of how it works for your organization. So we have 73 affiliates across the country. Some, are, um, some cover very local areas like we do in Los Angeles. Others cover regional areas. And we do have some affiliates who are multi-state now. Um, that number has come down quite a bit uh, from years past. But, um, but the structure is still maintained. We each have our own CEOs. We each have our own development team. The development team reports directly to the local CEO with a dotted line report to uh, the national organization. And that is PPFA. And I'll refer to it as that going forward. Um, we do have a national accreditation process, which all of our affiliates participate in. Uh, for most, it's every three years. And there are um, national guidelines and structures that uh, we all have to abide by and conform to. Um, and that's, that's, I would say, sort of the governance structure of PPFA and the relationship with the affiliate organizations. Um, we raise money locally for program services and advocacy work. 
the national organization raises money nationally, mostly for advocacy, some uh, grant making, and for their admin costs. Um, we do share some gifts, we share data, we share resources, we do have a fair share component to our work. Um, and the, uh, we, we also have um, a very interesting component to our development side, and that is that every year we have a National Development Officers Council Conference, and that's called DOC, D-O-C. It's put on by a volunteer committee of the development directors across the country, and uh, it's for all development professionals within the organization. Um, we often are stepchild-ish, if you will, but um, we are moving um, ever quickly into a, um, a format where our development professionals and our CEOs this year are having a one-day conference just prior to our development conference so that we can talk about the relationship between the chief development officers and the CEOs in each of our affiliates, how we interact, how important is the development team to the overall operation of each of the affiliates. And so that's new for us, and so maybe in, year, in months to come I might have some uh, different news to report. Um, but that's basically our structure at this point. Thank you, Barbara. And we actually will talk a little bit more about knowledge sharing and how that happens in the different organizations a little bit further into the webinar here. Um, so as we, regardless of the structure of the organization, there are some common themes that as we did our research across the country, we found were relevant to uh, a successful collaborative fundraising environment. And I think you'll find these themes will underline our conversation uh, as we continue here. But that's to have clearly defined roles, guidelines, and practices, to have open communication and transparency, and probably the key to all of this is a relentless focus on doing what is right for your donors. So let's look at how this really carries out in practice across the different functions of the development operation. And we're going to start with direct marketing, which uh, looks at direct mail, telemarketing, bonus-ons, and social media. So here are some of the findings from the research that Campbell and Company did. We found that often the strategies between the national organization and the chapters were not that well coordinated, that uh, mailings overlapped. A donor might receive a mailing from the local organization uh, a day after receive a mailing from the national organization. Um, we often found, too, that there were mixed messages depending on where that mailing was coming from. And, and real potential for donor confusion. And you know, I can share with you, we've uh, seen this in our, in our own household. Um, in the last six weeks of the calendar year, we collect all of the envelopes that come across through our mailbox and then sit down and make our decisions about our own philanthropic giving. And sometimes we'll have five or six envelopes, uh, appeal letters from the same organization. And I'm sitting there trying to sort out, well, which one, where did this come from? And if I use this response device, where is my gift going? And am I, if I want to support the local, do I use this envelope or that envelope? So that's the kind of donor confusion we certainly want to avoid uh, as we think about how we work uh, within our federated structures. The, the other piece that uh, we also saw as we did our research across the country is that uneven stewardship. So if a donor uh, makes a gift locally and then makes a gift uh, to the national organization and the next letter that that donor receives thanks them for a gift, what gift are they recognizing? They're really, for many organizations, there's no way to get a full picture of the donor's involvement with the uh, entire operation. So that's another thing we want to look at. So uh, here, here are some of the solutions, and I'm going to just run through these quickly, and then I'm going to ask Barbara and Jethro to kind of share with us how they've addressed these issues within their own organization. One, and, and this again will only work in certain structures, is a centralization of the direct marketing, where some part or all of the direct marketing is handled by the national organization. Uh, in, and, and this in particular really only applies to an organization that is a single 501c3, where you have a single database throughout the entire organization that really simplifies your ability to work together. Um, 
And there may be ways of arriving at this. Uh, and I think, Jethro, you've probably gone through this, or the Red Cross has gone through this and trying to bring all the databases together. And I know Planned Parenthood is moving in this direction in a, in a more limited way, but certainly thinking about that. Coordinated schedule for outreach, well-defined revenue sharing policies. These are some of the things that we have found that have helped mitigate some of the tensions that we see around direct marketing. So Barbara, let me start with you and, and have you share with us some of the things that you've seen within the Planned Parenthood context or in some of your work with uh, either earlier with uh, ADL or uh, with the American Red Cross where you've been able to address some of these um, uh, some, some of these tensions, some of these concerns by figuring out ways to work together more collaboratively. Sure. Um, so um, the ADL, all national um, direct marketing came out of New York. And, uh, and came across the country. We did no local direct mail to speak of at all. We did a lot of donor outreach, but never did. All direct mail came out of New York. All money went from that direct mail back to New York, and then chapter fair shares or organization fair shares came back to the local entity. Um, we found lots of issues with that. Um, mainly in the messaging because the messaging was primarily for the majority of donors who were on the East Coast and primarily in New York and Florida. And when it came west, it had a very different message coming west that was not um, engaging donors and not creating uh, enough revenue from those pieces. So there were lots of conversations about that. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get too far in making a lot of changes. Um, so we relied more on our individual connections with donors locally. Um, at Planned Parenthood right now, uh, we, uh, we have two, kind of two systems going on. We have a centralized direct marketing plan available to affiliates who are small and uh, who don't maybe have the capacity or, or the capability of doing uh, their own, and so they participate in that. And then we have the larger affiliates who have the capacity and the, um, the staffing to do our own. So here in Los Angeles, we do our own direct mail marketing, and we do about 16 direct mail pieces a year. The only caveat that we have and, and where we intersect with um, PPFA is that um, we're restricted to only doing two e mail campaigns a year because a majority of the e campaigns uh, that that go to um, constituents across the country come from PPFA. Uh, they're very heavy in e campaigns. So we try not to cross and there are certain times of the year where there's windows available for you to do local e campaigns just to your local constituency. So we do have that um, little bit of restriction there on that. Um, but Barbara, let, and, me, let me just yeah. jump in here. It sounds like there is a coordinated schedule, at least to some extent. Your um, national is able to let you know when they're sending out their mailings and you can, or vice versa, you can manage your mailing schedule around uh, what the uh, national organization is doing. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. And, and the one other thing that I would say about um, all of this is that you know, we do have donors who don't get their thank you notes from uh, the national organization and call us, and we do have gifts that go there and don't come here, and we try to stay connected and, and, and work those things out. But the one thing that I put in place when I started here was that the stewardship of local donors was not as good as I thought it should be, and we increased that tremendously. So donors, most of our donors, I'm going to say at $500 even and above, have some contact or some connection to our local office, either a relationship manager or prospect researcher, or an annual solicitor, so that when they call, we know who they are. Mm -hmm. Again, that stewardship piece is absolutely critical as you think about renewing donors in the future. Jethro, I know you've, uh, at the Red Cross, have been moving toward increased centralization of direct marketing. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and maybe some of the um, ways in which you've addressed the issue of confusion, possible confusion, or um, mixed messaging. Yeah, you're exactly right, Yes, we, we have been moving in that direction. I would say it's a, been a long and painful process, um, and I think everybody in the organization um, would agree with that. Um, even, you know, even once everybody was on board with the idea of having centralized data information, 
Um, it's been a long process, a multi-year process to get there. We've actually just um, brought on board the first of the seven divisions data in the last um, couple weeks, even though we've run from the national perspective direct response for about half the country um, for the last few years. Um, that's offline, online, it's all centralized um, coming out of national headquarters. Um, but it's been a, a real difficult, long challenge um, moving the data, building the data warehouse to support it, and integrating um, all of the information. Um, so, and, and having folks on different systems, having the online and the offline managed separately, having United Way blackouts and all the individual things that have to be managed for particular counties, really, across the country um, is, quite a, is quite a challenging process. But it's been important to us because it fits into sort of one of our basic principles at the Red Cross the last um, five, six years, which I would actually add to your, your keys for success slide on the previous slide, Edith, which is for everything we've done, we have tried to ask the question, uh, what makes sense to be done locally and do that locally, and what makes sense to be done nationally and do that nationally? And clearly when you ask that question, data management and direct marketing fall into the category of those things that, um, for all the reasons you've stated, make sense to be done centralized on a national level as long as you have that local stewardship and the local touch points that Barbara's talking about. So I think that's been, you know, we've recognized that and then how do you build that and how do you build the messaging to support that, so to, to Barbara's point, so that you've got messaging that is relevant in your area of the country. You know, it's, it doesn't work so well for us, for example, to send marketing messages to Iowa that are about hurricanes or to send marketing messages to Florida that are about tornadoes, right? So um, to be able to customize the messages for the geography, which is something we do, um, also takes a lot of work along the way. Um, and the, the last point that I would um, mention is the, the challenge of the mid-level, right? And I think for every organization, that can be a different dollar amount, but where your, your direct marketing and your major gifts cross over, sort of what that, that area that's in the middle of, the donors who may be giving through your direct marketing, but whose gifts are of a size, they fit into your major gift program, and you want to be having those personal touch points and how you coordinate that national direct marketing with those local with those local touch points, as Barbara mentioned, is, is something that we've been uh, trying to figure out and, and is somewhat of an ongoing challenge for us. So that brings up the kind of that first naughty issue that we talked about here, and that is who owns the donor. So how do you, each of you within your respective organizations, how is that handled if a donor gives to a national campaign? Well, Jethro, I assume it would really be quite different with the, the Red Cross because you are a single organization. But, if, but still, the same question comes up. If they give to the national organization, what's the communication back to the local chapter that this individual is a donor, and how does that uh, stewardship process then how 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 is that then handled? Right, and it's a little different for us because on the most part we're not managing donor relationships from our national headquarters. Um, some of the larger relationships we are, but for the most part we're not. So we're sharing that information uh, with the donors' home chapter, um, and you know depending on how the donor makes their gift, through what channel, and the size of the gift. Uh, we share that information instantaneously for online gifts the same day for a gift of $1,000 up and every other week for every single gift that comes into the organization. So that information is shared with the home chapter so that that chapter can start those personal touch points and those donor stewardship points according to their plan with the realization that a more rural community may be, you know, a big donor is going to be a different size gift than in a major metro market. Um, and we recognize that and those decisions um, are made on the local level. But we don't, you know, and I, I don't really, my sort of hair stands up the back of my neck when I hear the phrase own a donor, and although I know that's been common <laughs> language in the Red Cross and is, is common language in lots of other organizations. Um, of course, the, you know, the donor is a, a donor to the mission of the organization and really is committed to the, to the mission and they may be committed to that mission in a particular geography, um, or they may be committed to that mission, you know, all across the country or all, all around the world. But that's not my favorite way to, to think about responsibility for relationship management. 
And it's certainly not how the donor thinks about his or her relationship to the organization. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, Barbara, and, how, how does that information sharing happen at, the, at Planned Parenthood? So we have a couple of different ways. Um, we actually have a gift sharing um, stream here. So if a donor from Los Angeles, for instance, makes a gift to PPFA, either through a direct mail piece or online in particular, um, we will get half of that gift. Um, and we will be notified uh, monthly gifts that have come in, but we receive those, um, those checks quarterly. So we, we have information sharing on a monthly basis of who in Los Angeles has made a gift to um, Planned Parenthood Federation. And so we can then reach out to that person even before the gift actually appears in our system. Um, there are um, some uh, issues with some of that. In particular, um, we, um, the donor can give a gift directly to um, Planned Parenthood Federation, and often that happens online. And the reason that happens online is that even though we are all separate organizations and have separate CEOs and systems, our, um, our uh, website is a federated Planned Parenthood Federation website. And we each, if we choose to, have our own local pages on that website. But when you go to Planned Parenthood Los Angeles page and you click on Donate, you're immediately taken to the national organization page. And it does ask you where you would like to donate. And the drop-down menu appears. And the first thing in the drop-down is where it's most needed. So it doesn't necessarily terrifically distinguish Los Angeles if you're a Los Angeles donor or Chicago if you're a Chicago donor. And oftentimes, the donor will call us and say, I made a gift to you, and I didn't get a thank you. And we'll look it up, and sure enough, it's a gift to PPFA. We will call PPFA, and we will ask the donor, and this is, again, that whole stewardship issue, um, did you intend it to be directly for us, or did you intend it to be for the national organization or for us to split? And oftentimes, our donors will say, no, that should have come here. And so because of the way they get to the website is not really a clear path, uh, we can call the national organization, and we can tell them this gift was made by this donor. This is a donor of Planned Parenthood Los Angeles, and they would like the entire amount to come to us. And we can move that gift. Well, that, I mean, that sounds like a kind of labor-intensive way of having to address this. It is. <laughs> Obviously it is. awkward if the donor has yeah. to call you and raise that question. So yeah. advice, thoughts about how you might address that moving forward? Well, you know, every day we have a different opinion and a different uh, way of, of addressing that. Um, it, it's happening less and less, and I will still go back to that whole notion that the more we know our donors and the more our donors know us, the less those kinds of things happen. They usually happen by donors who um, maybe uh, there's a, a, a news item on, on TV about a political rally that Planned Parenthood is protesting or people are protesting against Planned Parenthood and they'll immediately go to their website and make a gift to Planned Parenthood, not realizing that if they want it local they can designate that. So it's happening less and less and I think that's because we really are beginning to know our donor pool in a much more um, intimate way. So that's one way to counter it, but I think we're going to just always have that issue. I guess the thing that we've yeah. been able to do with the Red Cross is to make a distinction between donor designation and credit for a chapter, right? So each of our regions or each of our chapters has a, a fundraising target, but what we've allowed them to do based on how we're set up is to fundraise regardless of the donor's designation. So if the donor wants to make a gift for our work, nationally or get our work internationally or for a particular disaster somewhere else in the country, the region still gets full credit for that gift um, towards their, their fundraising target for the year, even if that gift is not designated um, for their local geography. And what that means for our fundraisers is it's allowed our fundraisers to talk about the whole mission of the organization, local, national, and international. Um, and to raise larger gifts from donors as they talk about the whole mission as opposed to talking only about a particular piece of the mission in their local geography, which is how we did it probably 10 years ago for the most part. 
because of how we did the budgeting. But the changes we've made have opened our, our fundraisers to, to talk more broadly with donors, which I think has been, has been very successful. So Barbara, we have a question for you from the audience, and it's in reference to the to comment you made about the uh, affiliate receiving half of a, a national donation. And the question is, is that for any size donation uh, or only for a certain dollar amount? Um, it's usually uh, motivated by the way the gift is given. So if it's online or in response to uh, a generic direct mail piece that PPFA has sent out, then we will get half of it. If it's a gift from Los Angeles to a specific program or a specific need through the Federation, it will stay with the Federation. Um, so it just depends on what the gift is. And, and again, as, as Jethro, Jeth Jethro has said, again, further complicating and further um, requiring us to be really good investigators uh, on, on a daily basis. That, um, but, it, but it absolutely is 100% on any online gift um, and any uh, just generic direct mail. So short answer to your question is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Well, we're going to move on and talk about um, major and plan giving, and we're going to see that some of the same issues surface again um, when we're looking at donors of larger gifts. And some of the findings that, uh, that we saw as we worked across the country is, again, staff, and at the risk of having the hair on the back of your neck, Jethro, stand up, um, is staff arguing over turf. Uh, and again, it uh, kind of goes back to that notion of who owns the donor. And what we've seen is that sometimes leads to what I might describe um, as, as hoarding. Uh, a local major gifts officer will, de will determine that this prospect is his or her prospect, and they'll hang on to that prospect and then not do anything with that prospect because there's so many other things on his or her plate. Uh, whereas in the meantime, the national organization might have been able to come in and ask for a gift that would benefit both local and national. So obviously, that behavior that we want to try to avoid at all costs. But also, that kind of behavior leads to a frayed sense of trust between the local and the national organization. And again, as we had talked earlier, lost opportunities for increased engagement and investment. Um, so some of this gets back to messaging. Some of this gets back to uh, stewardship and donor recognition. Um, I know both of you have situations, and Jethro, you just referenced this, where donors, um, you have high potential states let's say a state like Connecticut, uh, but which probably, hopefully, doesn't suffer the same level of disaster as a state like Florida or Texas. And Texas may have less potential for fundraising. Uh, Barbara, you had some of a similar situation at Planned Parenthood, where you have donors locally that support particularly political campaigns in other parts of the country mm -hmm. uh, where the work of Planned Parenthood is threatened. Um, so that gets back to messaging, and particularly around the major and planned giving prospects. So how, how do you, let me ask both of you, some of the ways in which you deal with this at the major and planned gift effort. Jethro, do you want to do you want to start? And we've got some thoughts about solutions here, but let's, let's hear from you, and then we'll uh, expand on that. Sure. I, I think your, your last bullet there that you have up under, under findings is really a key one, that the organizations need to figure out how, within the structure you have, how you work things so that you're engaging your donors in the mission of the organization. And I, and I think this is an area in which we haven't done as good a job um, as we could have over the years. Uh, where we aren't necessarily throughout the year engaging the donors in the mission in such a way that they're going to want um, to make greater investment. And I, and I think what we've seen, and, and I've seen at other organizations too, and I'm interested in Barbara's take on it, which is when you can develop a system whereby donors have opportunities for multiple different touch points, uh, where they have the opportunities, and here we're obviously talking about, about major donors, where they have the opportunities for touch points locally, where they have the opportunities for touch points, nationally, and they can experience the organization in different ways, that increases their, their lifetime giving to the their organization and the overall value 
um, to the organization of that donor relationship. And, and the question is, how do you build the, um, the systems and the structures in such a way that allows you to have those multiple different touch points, and it's coordinated um, from, the, from the donor's perspective? And, and I would agree with all of that. I mean, I think, again, you know, my, my development hat is always about relationship. And um, we do have um, in Los Angeles Planned Parenthood a particularly different situation than a lot of our sister affiliates across the country. Um, the political climate is better. The environment is better in terms of how, what our flexibility is in, in many circumstances. Um, our major in plan giving at Planned Parenthood Los Angeles is basically a locally owned and operated uh, activity. We, um, all of our major gift givers here are giving to major projects of our affiliate, whether it's um, research or uh, community canvassing or sex education in the schools. All, all of our major gift givers and our major gift program centers around our projects and uh, and programs that are not funded by uh, you know the the fee for service that we get uh, or our donors so um, so that kind of gives a little bit of a context around our major gift and plan giving program it's very localized um, there there are some efforts nationally for major and plan gifts um, they don't get very far across the country. Uh, and some of our affiliates probably um, really are not even candidates for some of those services. Um, but the one thing I will say is that we, um, we, ha we share a number of very large donors with the national organization. And we have a major gifts person, a national major gifts person in San Francisco right now who's been there for about a year and a half or two years. And we have created a great, really strong relationship with her. And we talk to each other about donors all the time. And we do share two very large donors who give very large gifts to both the national organization and to our local affiliate. So, um, you know, again, for me, it's all about that relationship. And I know it's quite different for other national organizations with local focus. It doesn't necessarily operate that way. But because we're single entities as well as part of a national organization, we have some of that in our DNA locally that we um, take advantage of. Yeah, and, and Barbara, you alluded to communications and, you know, mm -hmm. and having a good uh, methods for communications and open dialogue with the with the national staff, and, and I think that's really key, and and the ability to share information back and forth, and and for us, um, it's been a, a challenge, but it's also helped that uh, we have a national CRM. So in the last two years, we've rolled out um, Salesforce.com as a national uh, relationship management database. Uh, actually separate from our donor database, which is what we're now in the process of integrating. So this will all be integrated uh, with the Salesforce piece as well. But the visibility that we've created by having one um, shared relationship management system that all fundraisers across the country are using um, is great. And some chapters use it more than others, but is great because it does allow that visibility and that shared information and it supports and encourages communication and knowledge sharing in a way that we haven't had in the past. Yeah. So in your responses, you've really anticipated some of the solutions that I wanted to highlight here and added some others, but certainly strong internal communications is, is key to a successful collaborative fundraising environment. And clearly established protocols, including where you can a single relationship manager, but certainly, Jethro, as you suggest, having a relationship management system where everyone who's involved with a potential donor or donor to the organization can see what the action is or the interaction is with that donor. And, and someone is acting as the traffic cop, for lack of a better word, around the interactions with that donor. I don't mean that in a negative sense, but uh, really facilitating the right kinds of conversations happening around that person. Um, you mentioned multiple uh, touch points with the donor. And Barbara, you talked about mm -hmm. uh, the opportunity to make an impact gift at the local level. Unfortunately, this isn't interactive, so I can't type up these solutions uh, as we're talking here. But I just wanted to bring those up again. And obviously, the key one is active listening, staying 
donor-centered. But I want to circle back to a question that came from one of our audience members that really relates to the plan giving part of the equation here, and that is what happens in the case of a, um, a plan gift donor who leaves the um, money in his or her bequest to the organization and simply names Planned Parenthood or American Red Cross. Uh, how do you negotiate where that money eventually goes uh, when you can no longer have the conversation with the donor about what his or her intentions were? Now that's a, a great a great question. And you know, number one, we follow donor intent. So if the donor um, has made clear their intent on, on how they'd like those funds used, uh, whether they want it all to go in endowment or they want it all restricted um, to a particular geography, we of course are, are following the donor intent. If it just says American Red Cross and there's no sense of the donor intent beyond that, um, the gift is split 50-50 uh, between the, the, the endowment and the local annual needs of the donor's home territory, if you will. So half of it goes into the uh, national endowment and half of it goes um, to the, the, toward the budget, if you will, or toward the revenue target of the, the local chapter. Yeah, great. That gets back to the state where you, yeah, go ahead, Barbara, please. No, I was just going to say, for us, it's a little bit more complicated than that because we're all individual and uh, majority of the affiliates have plan giving programs, but some do not. Um, I don't believe in the almost two years I've been here that I've seen a plan gift come across or a bequest that, um, that just says Planned Parenthood. Um, I think we've been very good about educating our donors and we continue to be very strong in that area about, you know, if your intent is to leave it to Planned Parenthood Los Angeles, here's the language you need to use. And I think PPFA does the same thing if, you, if, if your intent is to leave it to the national organization, uh, you do this. There are some um, bequests that are split. So we did have a donor um, last year who uh, left us in her will and uh, it just said Planned Parenthood and she was from Los Angeles. So that was a split gift and, and that determination is made by PPFA. Uh, if they had had a relationship with her or we had had a relationship with her, we probably would have had a conversation about that. But neither entity had a relationship and oftentimes that's exactly the kind of bequest that we get here is people we didn't even know and people who we have no relationship with. So when that happens, we do have a conversation both nationally and locally about uh, you know, the intent. Our national organization uh, does all of our um, charitable gift annuities. So um, in that regard, if it's designated for Los Angeles, when that person passes away, those uh, residuals come to our organization. If it's undesignated, I've not seen that yet, but my sense is that there would be a conversation and a potential split at that point. So thank you. So the takeaway here is really to continue to educate your donor base about mm -hmm. uh, making their intentions clear uh, so there isn't that kind of confusion. We're going to move on to a slightly different topic here is kind of our last, the last kind of main area that we want to focus on and that's the area of knowledge sharing. Um, and, and as you can see, there, there are so many other subject matter, subject areas we could get into, but in an hour we can only cover so much. But um, I did want to spend a few minutes on this and that, um, what, and again, one of the, some of the things that we learned in our research uh, and in our work across the country is that we do see that the national office can provide a range of resources and training. And in fact, in some of your earlier comments, you referenced the fact that uh, you, you've talked about what national can provide uh, to, across the country. Uh, but also local staff have transferable experiences and your colleagues in other parts of the country can benefit from that experience and you can benefit from the experience they've had. But the problem is that staff are often uncertain about whom to call for what information. So there are a number of ways that we've seen that organizations have addressed this question of knowledge sharing. and. One is um, online resource centers or training on demand. Uh, many organizations have intranets, and we hear a lot of comments. Intranets seem to be the thing that people most like to grumble about. Um, <laughs> it's a, it can be a wonderful resource, but if it's not user-friendly, if it's not easy to navigate, if, if it just becomes more of a hassle than it's worth for a lot of people. So we'd love to hear your comments on that. 
Uh, we know that many organizations have national staff assigned to regions. Jeff Rowe talked about that a minute ago. Uh, and the, um, Barbara, you talked about the, the DOC conference, uh, com the National Conference of Development Officers around the country. And Jethro, I know Red Cross used to do that. They don't do it uh, any longer, at least not on a national basis. And I know this becomes a huge concern. But I will tell you that when I was talking with Barbara earlier, she told me that that National Red Cross, National Red Cross Development Officers Conference that she used to go to was one of the best she ever attended. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> those are some of the kind of the, the tensions that any organization deals with in figuring out how to best transfer that knowledge to its staff across the country. So um, let me encourage my panelists to weigh in here. Barbara, do you want to start? Sure. I um, mentioned sure. the DOC conference earlier uh, in terms yeah. of an important yeah. report. The one thing that I would say about um, knowledge sharing, and I found this to be true whether I was at the ADL, the Red Cross, or now at Planned Parenthood, all three of whom at some point in their lifespan have had development conferences. The key for me is that um, I want to know who my colleagues are across the country because that's where the real information is. And so I would say to any fundraiser on the phone who's part of any national organization, no matter which side of the organization you're on, that we tend to not do this in our own shops. We tend not to create strong relationships like we do with our donors, with our colleagues and our, and our um, uh, affiliates across the country who do the same kind of work that we do. And I would just say, if you can do one thing to share knowledge, and that is get to know your colleagues, get to know who's doing similar work that you're doing somewhere else in the country, call them up, you know, go for coffee if you have an opportunity to be in the neighborhood. Create that relationship because, to me, that's where I always got most of my knowledge and my information. And just it's just nice to know that there's somebody in the country who is sharing the same joys and frustrations that you're sharing. So that's the first thing I would say. And then um, we do have an internet. I'm not going to comment on the internet because. Edith, you probably heard all the really horrible things that I might say about our internet. It needs work. Um, but our, our national conference is really, um, really great. And this year is no different. And uh, it's, it's just an opportunity for us to really share best practices. And we invite the, um, our colleagues from across the country to be presenters at the conference. So you're not, you're not necessarily hearing from a knowledge expert in the area of plan giving, but you're hearing from a colleague somewhere else in the country who has a successful plan giving program and how did they do it and how does that translate to what you can do in your shop. So um, those two things I think are really important. Thank you. Jethro, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I would agree, right? That should be one of the advantages of a fundraiser of working at a, a large national organization should be the opportunities to work with your colleagues, to learn from your colleagues, um, to have opportunities for, for growth and, and career development that you wouldn't have if you were in a, a smaller um, shop and or a community-based organization. So, so absolutely, I mean, I think that's, um, that's one of the things that greatly attracts me to to working in a, in a large national organization that the challenge for us at the Red Cross um, has been just being in a difficult financial environment um, the last you know six eight ten years now and um, and trying to decide how we can best spend our donors funds and what can we do that is uh, important and successful around training but that doesn't actually have the expenses associated with a large national conference. And it's been, it's been challenging, but we've, uh, while we don't do the large national conference anymore, we do do a, uh, conferences on a divisional level. Uh, we do do specialized um, training sessions, and we bring together um, our largest metro markets for, for meetings uh, without necessarily bringing the whole country together. So there, there are things we do that I guess are, are more targeted and, and hopefully fulfill some of the um, the desires and, and the purposes that Barbara was talking about. But it certainly is a, um, an, an important thing and should be one of the reasons um, that the impact that a, a fundraiser has of working at a large national organization. And what a wonderful resource to be able to tap the, the knowledge and wisdom of your colleagues across the country. I want to just remind the audience we're coming into the home stretch here. So if you have a question you want to raise with uh, one of our panelists, send that in right now. 
um, we're coming in uh, to the last couple of slides here. Um, so let me let me try to summarize here, and um, actually I don't think I'm going to be able to do that because it's such a broad topic. But I think if we've taken away anything from this conversation um, in the webinar that's labeled one size does not fit all, is that indeed we've got to find the right solutions that make sense for our organization and our culture. Uh, and in doing though, in doing that, there are some things that we all need to take into consideration. One is to be very thoughtful in our planning, to continue to communicate clearly with one another, particularly as we're making changes to the way that we work together. Uh, it's important to monitor the progress that we're making because there will be reasons to fine tune our strategies down the road if something isn't working. We want to be nimble enough to, to fix it, to hear from our donors or hear from our colleagues across the country that it just isn't working right for them. So how do, how do we address that? Um, that ongoing refinement is critical. And then probably the most important piece is patience. Um, because we know these things take time. Jeffrey, you were talking about some of the transitions that you've made at the Red Cross that have been going on for several years, some of which uh, are continuing to go on. We know that Planned Parenthood has been testing a collaborative fundraising model with uh, five of its affiliates in the national organization. I think this, you're now in the third year of that. So it does take time to change the way in which you work together. But in the end, if you're all working toward the same common goal, which you which is to support the mission of the organization. It's all worth doing. So as we come into the final minutes here, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to share with the audience the one, if, they, if you remember anything out of this webinar this, today, what is the one thing you hope our audience takes away with them? Barbara, we'll start with you. I knew you were going to say that. Um, <laughs> so I, I would say it's probably two things. I would say it's stewardship of your donors. Really know your donors. Know what they're thinking. Know what their, where their passion is and where, where they want to support the mission. And don't be afraid to share that with, if you're national, to share it with the local affiliate or if you're local, to share that with national. So I would say that I'm just going to leave it at that. I think that's the one thing that um, you know is top of everyone's mind. But if you do that, I think you'll find the relationships between the entities work much better. Thank you, Jethro. Uh, Barbara stole mine. No, um, I've got <laughs> slightly slightly different take on, but uh, similar in some ways. Uh, I would just encourage everybody to take the time to step back and focus on how you're doing things and are what you're doing uh, going to lead to the uh, most likely way of achieving, achieving the mission of the organization and to put yourself in the donor's shoes as you ask that question. And if you're, if you're battling over turf or if you're questioning who owns a donor, to, to, to try to, to step back and get out of, of your shoes as a fundraiser and what you're trying to accomplish for the year and try to think about it from the donor's perspective. And if the donor is interested in fulfilling the mission of the organization, how can that best be done? And if you, if you think about it from that perspective, sometimes you think about things with a different way and a different lens um, than you might otherwise. And sometimes you make different decisions than you would have made when you were, than when you were in your, um, your own uh, ongoing uh, thought structure for the year. Well said. Thank you both. Uh, very important points to take away from this conversation. If anyone uh, listening in would like to read more uh, and see more detail uh, on the research that we did, uh, our report called Are We In This Together is on the Campbell & Company website. So just uh, log on to www.campbellcompany.com and search for Are We In This Together and uh, you'll learn more. And as you'll see, there are lots more, lot, a lot more uh, that we could talk about on this subject. We could go on for hours here. We didn't even touch board, uh, how the role of the board and some other aspects here. So maybe that's, uh, we'll save that for a future webinar. Uh, but I want to thank my panelists. A round of applause, Barbara, Jethro, thank you very much for sharing your experience and wisdom with us today. And I'm going to turn this back over to my colleague, Sarah Barnes, to wrap up. Great. Thanks, everyone. And, and thank you uh, to everybody out there who joined us today. 
our final webinar uh, for this season is our Giving USA webinar where we'll be launching the data results from 2013, and this is going to be on Tuesday, June 17th. Um, and it is complimentary, and you can register at our website. So again, thank you to everyone. We hope that warm and nice weather is heading your way, and we will be in touch. Thanks so much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.